Since we do find silence in the center of the meditation, please use this moment to turn your phone off or silence it or crush it underfoot. Patty's talk title today is called Love is the Portal. So we found this chant that's actually sort of old, but it works great. Door of my heart, open wide, I wait for God. Door of my heart, open wide, I wait for God. Night and day, night and day, night and day, I wait for God. Night and day, night and day, night and day. For our meditation today, we're going to sing Hugh. Hugh is the most ancient secret name for God. It was sung to the sun god, and the word Alleluia comes from this word, Hugh. The singing of the word Hugh is considered a love song to God. It can be sung aloud or silently to oneself. And you sing this word by just putting your attention on your third eye, opening your heart to love, and sing it like this, Hugh. And we'll sing Hugh together for about three minutes, and then I'll lead you in a short guided meditation. Sing with me. Yeah. 
see yourself stepping through a doorway into a light and as you step through feel that light grow, expand and bathe you filling you with its warmth and love and allow your heart to open to this light and just let this in. And in this place of love and connection, ask, what can I do to bring more of this light and love into my life? And then gently bring your attention back, back to your body, into this room, into the light in this room. May the blessings be.
So I feel so fortunate that I got to hear that twice today. <laughs> I love that. Happy New Year. I'm so happy to be your first Sunday speaker in 2013. I just love it. I love the new year. And, uh, you know, I wanted to connect with you. Uh, so I decided I would do a technique, which I learned which is where I go into contemplation, which is an active form of meditation. You use your imagination as a springboard for an experience. And I met with you inwardly to see what, what would you like me to talk about? What could I speak to that would speak to you? And, and also what stories could I tell? And so some of you, you know, you wanted to know about goal setting. And so that's great, and because we all have a hard time remembering what our goals were after about two weeks. So how could we best do that? And, and then others of you wanted me to speak about love. And then there was a whole bunch of you that were thinking about the Seahawks. <laughs> because really, you know, I'm setting my intention about those Seahawks. I don't know about you, so... <laughs> But I love the new year because it's a chance to look at yourself with fresh eyes. And so I do this by using a drawing, which I included in your program today, so that you could have one yourself and you could go and work with it when you weren't here. And what I do with this is I look at where I am right now, the current state of me, how everything's going, and then I, I imagine a year from today in the best possible scenario. And what I use to get there is really one of the only common languages that we have, which is our imagination. We all share this, this, and love. And so I embed and immerse myself into that, that desired new reality I want, and I put everything into it. I put creativity, and I put color, and I put intention, and I put love. And this, to me, does something extraordinary for myself, for my clients, or friends that have used this particular process, something happens. It's like a human fax machine. We send that out into the universe, and then our brain aligns to that. It repatterns itself so that those things in that vision begin to show up in our world. And I love that. And I think about what is it that I am sending out 
What am I embedding into that right side? Well, it's my intention. It's my desire to be my best self and to have the dream of my, my best year ever. And I embed it with love because I am loved, I'm soul, and I exist because God loves me. And I, I am love, I give love, and everything I do comes from that place of love. And so I use this process often when I want to get inspired because it happened to me in this way. Um, before I was an illustrator, business consultant, or all of that, I was a comic actor. And I wasn't really an actor. I was a performance artist. How many of you know what a performance artist is? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, a performance artist, you know, uh, combines music and um, movies and some improvisational thing jigs together into a performance. And somebody um, that I uh, was mentored by said to me once, you know, um, you really should get some acting lessons. <laughs> So one year I went to New York and I got some acting lessons and on my weekends I had time off and so I was an actor so I didn't make a lot of money so I went to Columbus Circle and I would do street theater and pass the hat to make a little spare change. And so I'd get out there at 57th and Columbus Circle and do my routine. And one, one Sunday, I had my friend visiting from Seattle, and so we went there, and I did my little routine where I transformed myself into a tennis player, pull a tennis racket out of a baby buggy all the while, lipping, lip syncing, Billie Jean is not my lover, she's just a girl who thinks that I'm the one. Woo! Performance art. <laughs> and I passed the hat, and you know, we did pretty good, so we decided we'd go downtown and have some pizza. And on our way downtown, we passed through the Broadway section, and Frank turned to me and he said, hey, Patty, did you ever want to be on Broadway? And I said, Frank, I am a performance artist. I would only be off Broadway. But then, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I started to imagine myself, like if I were on Broadway, I'd go down the stage door into my dressing room where there'd be a star in my name, and my costumes would be all laid out on that table, and, and then I'd get all my makeup on, and I'd go stand behind that red velvet curtain and wait for them to call places, and this quiet hush comes on as the lights go out. And it was thrilling. And it was really thrilling when I went back to Seattle and, you know, continued to schlep burritos at Mama's Mexican Kitchen on 2nd and Bell. <laughs> and it kept me very inspired. And when I would feel low, you know, I'd play that fantasy in my head and I'd say, well, if I was on Broadway, where would our opening night party be? And I'd say, ooh, Tavern on the Green. And if I were on Broadway, well, who would I want to meet? Oh, well, Steve Martin or maybe Robin Williams. And then I'd just go back and, you know, continue delivering a burrito Nolasco. And then one fall, this thing happened. My mom was sick, and so I was flying to L.A., and so I lost all my shifts at Mama's Mexican Kitchen, and the NEA had dried up, and so they weren't funding performance art anymore. And so, you know, it was the end of the month, and I had to make my rent. So I'm pretty industrious. So I went in my garage, and I got a rake, and I marched up to Capitol Hill, and I knocked on some of the wealthiest homes, you know, asking, could I rake your yard for $10 a yard? Now, I was a performance artist, so my hair at this point was chartreuse, and nobody would even open their door, <laughs> let alone let me come break their yard, except for a Presbyterian minister, whose yard was the size of a football field. <laughs> and I'm out there raking, and the wind's blowing, and it's raining. You know, it's Seattle, I'm raking, raking. After three hours, you know, I'm weeping and raking, and he comes out and gives me $10 and sends me home. And when I get there, you know, my answering machine is blinking. Now, how many of you ever had an answering machine that blinked? Raise your hand. Okay, my people. <laughs> and it, 
there were messages there from my agent and from best friends who said, Patty, they're auditioning performance artists at the Seattle Rep. You should go down there. And even though I never auditioned for anybody else's material, I decided I was going to take my resume and go down there, and so I did. I got in that line that went around the block, and when I got up there, gosh, they want you to do this weird little dance step, and I'm not a dancer, but I just surrendered, and I said, okay, whatever, I'm here. Let's do this thing. And so I do my little dance step, and I get into the show. And then this amazing thing happens. It goes from this little tiny theater to the main stage of the Seattle Rep. And then six months later, it goes from the Seattle Rep to the Kennedy Center in DC. And then six months later, it goes where? <laughs> Opening night is where? Tavern on the Green. And when I look up from getting my parents a couple of drinks, who am I standing next to? Steve Martin and Robin Williams. Yep. <laughs> and so I, I am a true believer of this inner process of visioning because it's happened for me. But it wasn't until sometime after that that I began to use a picture to an outward picture and draw a picture. Because, you know, being a performer, Broadway is like the pinnacle, right? And we know how the world works. What goes up must come down. And so not more than a year later, I was in the bottom. I didn't know who I was. I had an artistic break. I couldn't perform anymore. I didn't want to perform. And I was just desperate. I thought, well, who am I? Am I not an actor? Who am I? And so I went into contemplation and I asked, you know, please show me. What now? And I got this little tiny nudge to draw a picture. And on the left side, of this piece of paper, I drew where I was. And on the right side, I imagined where I wanted to be a year from today. And because I didn't know who I wanted to be or a job or things, I put the spiritual qualities I wanted in myself at the end of the change. And I figured life would fill in the rest. And then I looked at that picture and Something about it healed me. That right side, I felt hope. I felt inspired. I felt all the things that I wanted there. And I knew I would find my purpose again. And so I closed my eyes and I just asked, okay, if I'm here and I got to get there, I got to do three things. If I just do three really bold things, I can get myself there. And it occurred to me, these three things, and I wrote them on these little bridges I drew, and one of them, I know, was let go of the past. And so I did. And then, my phone rang, of course, and it was someone asking me, would I do team building? And then the next thing I knew, I was going back to school and then I was incorporating drawing, and I was working with companies doing change, and all of the things of writing and speaking that bring me here today. And to me, this is so fantastic, what happens, really, when you let go, and you let things occur. And what's fascinating to me about the goal-setting process is that you know, there's all these new books about neuroscience. Have you noticed this? But they don't really know what happens out there. They know that if you draw pictures, 70% more likely that you'll remember what's in the picture and you'll focus on that and that will bring things to you. But they don't know how that bring thing to you part is, right? Because that's outside the box of the brain. That's the spiritual world that we live in. And recently, I read this fantastic book. It's by a neurosurgeon. His name is Dr. Eben Alexander, and he wrote a book called Proof of Heaven. How many of you have read this book? It's really an amazing account. 
he gets an E. coli virus in his body and he dies for seven days. And his brain is, it stopped working completely, but he's kept alive with a breathing machine and IVs, right? So he's still alive. And after seven days, he hears his son calling him, needing him. And so he comes back to life. And then he tells his account of his experience in heaven in this book. And it is amazing. And of course, then he tries to explain it to the medical profession, which goes really well for him, you can imagine. <laughs> but one of the things that he writes is, true thought is pre-physical. This is the thinking behind the thinking responsible for all the genuinely consequential choices we make in the world. Fast as lightning, we make connections not on a linear deduction. Thinking outside the brain, our truest and deepest self is free. And this pre-thinking is our spiritual self, of course. That's the part of us that I like to goal set from. The part that appears when we close our eyes and we ask, what now? What now? So, how do we stay connected to that pre-thinking part of ourself? Well, he says, and all the teachers we have ever studied with over time tell us, it's through love, love and compassion. So when you're setting your goals for 2013, look at where you are, then close your eyes and imagine Dream, spin the best possible reality of, for you one year from today and capture it in a simple little picture and then fill it with love. Fill it with color and imagination and then ask that deepest part of you, you know, the part that has lived before and will live on forever. The part that's connected to everything and everyone. What now? What bold step can I take now to take myself further? And then quick, write it down, whatever you get. And every time you feel down at the bottom, look at this drawing and fill your heart with love. Fill it for you, love yourself, and love everyone else. Love you, and you, and you. Because love is the portal. Love is the portal. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Remember, uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, I believe it's in the chapel, there is a workshop, more, more of Patty. So if you enjoyed that, please come. And there is information and materials out in the lobby that she has as well. So today is January 6th, and in the traditional Christian liturgy, this is Twelfth Night. This is the night, this is the day, the night that the wise men finally arrived at the manger to give their gifts. And so... It is appropriate. This is a time for us to give our gifts. So I'd invite you to take your gift in your hand, your tithe, your love offering. If you give electronically or through the mail, hold that gift in your mind's eye. And together, let us put a blessing on these gifts. It's in your program. Together, I give willingly, joyfully, and lovingly, knowing that God is the constant source of my supply. I give with graciousness, and I receive with gratitude, and so it is. Just
the victim of my circumstances The underdog who never gets the Take the wheel.